Dr. Hakeem Adi is a British historian and scholar who specializes in African affairs. He has been serving as a professor of history of Africa and the African diaspora at the University of Chichester in the UK. He is the first British historian, African British historian, to become a professor of history in the UK. He has written widely and exceptionally on topics of Pan-Africanism, the modern political history of Africa, and the African diaspora. He is the author of more than 11 texts, also some uh, children's texts. Uh, One of his most recent is African and Caribbean Peoples in Britain, uh, which I believe is on Allen Lane Press. He has also written Mm -hmm. Pan-Africanism, a history on Bloomsbury Academia, Uh, Pan-Africanism and Communism, the Communist International Africa and the Diaspora in 1919 and 1939, and along with Marika Sherwood, um, great book, the 1945 Manchester Pan-African Congress Revisited. He joins Africa today to discuss his work on Pan-Africanism, his extensive writing on African and Caribbean peoples in Britain, and recent developments at Chichester University, uh, which are important in understanding this struggle around, as uh, Barbara Ransby's and others would say, the black radical tradition in terms of the African-American, Caribbean, black experience. The website for Dr. Hakeem Adi is www.hakimadi.org. Dr. Adi, thanks for joining Africa today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Great to be with you. Good. I want to congratulate you, first of all, on being uh, shortlisted for the uh, Wolfson uh, Literary Award. This, this Is it not, and give us some background here, uh, one of the most distinguished history prizes. Is that correct? It is the most prestigious history prize uh, in Britain. Uh, annually, uh, six are uh, shortlisted every year. And I'm very happy to be one of those who has been shortlisted this year, for, as you said, for the book African and Caribbean People in Britain, A History, which uh, came out in paperback in the paperback edition just last week. Oh, oh, fantastic. That'll get more people taking a, uh, a read at it. Why did you choose on your website, you chose a quote from Frederick Douglass and A historian like you, there's a lot of things you could choose. Why did you choose that quote from Frederick Douglass? Uh, Well, that's that's just the way the world is, the way the life is. Um, You know, if without struggle, there's no progress. And uh, that's, I think, what many of us have found, that um, that is how we move things forward. It's, It's really, it's an important quote in the sense that it shows that we are the, the agents of change. We are the makers of history. We are our own liberators, however you want to phrase it. Um, but we have to engage in that struggle. The struggle is there. The struggle is ongoing um, in a way, whether we like it or not. It exists objectively. But when we're conscious of it and we engage in it, that is when we you know, we make progress in anything we're doing, how human beings have made progress from the earliest times, whether it's a struggle against nature and natural environment, or it's a struggle um, for the rights of people generally. This is how history has moved forward. This is what history is, is really about. And this is what, as I say, I think many of us are, our lives show us to be the case. Mm -hmm. And we have to engage with that. We have to embrace it as part of being human. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's why it's there. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned, and we're working to a discussion about very, very recent uh, developments in 2023. But when you presented at the Liverpool event, you were saying something that really froze me in my track. And you recounted the story of the Haitian Revolution. The lifespan mm-hmm. of Haitians was seven years. How do you, mm-hmm. how does that center in some senses what you've devoted what appears to be your entire life to, uh, Dr. Adi? Well, I used 
uh, the example then, I think, because obviously we were commemorating the uh, beginnings of that revolution, uh, which is, you know, celebrated internationally every August the 22nd, August the 23rd. Um, you know, there's so many things that we, we could say about that event and why it's significant. But I think the main point I was raising was that whatever situation we're in, you know, however dire the situation is, we have to have, you know, confidence in our own abilities to transform things. So in the, the French colony, San Domingo, at that, at that time, the, the average life expectancy of Africans was seven years. You know, it was the, the, the biggest uh, plantation, if you like, uh, uh, dealing with or held, holding captives, enslaved Africans in the world, and so on. So, but those Africans didn't didn't resign themselves to their fate or to their early death. They got together, they organized themselves, they fought for over a decade to liberate themselves and to set an example for people all over the world, you know, ever since. And so I think that's what I was alluding to, that however desperate our situation is, we shouldn't give up. We should keep fighting. We should unite. We should organize ourselves. We should engage in the struggle. And in that struggle, is our security, is our hope, is our prospects of transforming things. You know, we ourselves are those agents of change. We shouldn't think somebody else is going to come and save us. We have to do it. And, um, and if we do it, then we may well be successful um, or we may bring into being various elements of success or encourage others or change the situation or be able to resist the attacks that are raining down on us. We have to act, you know, we have to act in our own interests and struggle. So that's why I use that particular example. It, it was quite good, and I encourage people to uh, Google that and take a look at your, your presentation on uh, Liverpool. If someone mentions uh, people who first, I think, referred me to your work or you mentioned Dr. Hakim Adi. The word that comes up is Pan-Africanism. Why, as a scholar, did you choose to put your feet and your hands on the theme of Pan-Africanism? Well, I, people do say that. Um, I don't think I really chose it. It's more that it chose me. Okay. Um, when I began my earliest work, it was looking at Africans in Britain, uh, specifically West Africans, those from places like Nigeria and Sierra Leone and so on, who were kind of student politicians. They were in Britain studying, but they engaged in anti-colonial politics of various kinds and so on. And, but it was clear that in studying them, they engaged in pan-African activities of one sort or another. Just the fact that students from four different British colonies in West Africa got together to engage, to engage, uh, to deal with the, with colonial rule, with the invasion of the continent, to defend themselves against racism in Britain. Just that act in itself was an act of pan-Africanism. Then, if you look to their activities, they united with other people from the African continent who weren't from West Africa. Then you found they, they united with other people from the Caribbean or from the US who were in Britain or in other parts of the world, or they united with people from Brazil or whatever. So they were engaged in a whole range of pan-African activities, connected with a whole range of pan-African networks across the world and throughout Africa. Um, and so it was impossible to look at these students in Britain without dealing with the kind of pan-African world in which they inhabited and in which they located their struggle. And so that initial research then led me to look at 
other aspects of those networks and that activity, some of them in Britain, like the Manchester uh, Pan-African Congress. And then it became apparent that, well, Pan-Africanism was really, you could say its home was in Britain almost, because once you start looking at the history of modern Pan-Africanism, you see the first Pan-African Conference was held in London in 1900. Um, the you know second Pan African Congress was was held in London in 1921, or partly held in London. The third was held in London in 1923, and so on. Some of the key figures of the Pan African pantheon, as it were, whether it's you know Jomo Kenyatta, Kwame Nkrumah, Marcus Garvey, Amos, Amy Ashwood Garvey, George Padmore, you can go on and on and on, were based in Britain and worked in Britain. The most famous of all the congresses was held in Manchester and just goes on and on and on. So by looking at initially Africans in Britain, I became interested in and, and needed to discover for myself and understand for myself what this Pan-Africanism was about, its significance and importance. Um, and kind of one thing led to another. Mm -hmm. uh, without me consciously saying that I was going to focus on gotcha. it, it kind of focused on me, and it got me, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, w w tell us, because this show is being taped from the, from the U.S., of course, people can listen to it globally, but tell us about something about the uniqueness, if that's the right word, the peculiarities of the U.K., of the British Black African Caribbean experience, which would be food for thought for those of us who, on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, whether it be North America, the Caribbean, or the South America, what what's what's unique? What's different? What's the same, uh, Doctor Adi? Well, I mean, one thing which is, I don't know if it's unique, but it's significant about the, the diaspora in Britain. Uh, is that it's been in existence for a very long time. You know, my recent book, African and Caribbean People in Britain, goes back around 2,000 years, although there's some likelihood that Africans were in Britain even earlier, but certainly from around 2,000 years ago. So it's a very, very long history, um, which is of significance. So that's one thing. I suppose it's important to, to be aware of this longevity. Um, and it's a history which is often hidden and it's important to to bring it out and make, make people aware of it. The second thing is clearly Britain's role in the world as a, a global power, as an imperialist power, as a colonial power meant that people gravitated to Britain, particularly London, but also other places, um, as a, a kind of political center. You know, that if people were campaigning, because Britain had the largest empire, that attracted people from the empire to come to Britain for education or for work or for various other reasons. And so you had communities of people from all over the world, from Africa, from the Caribbean, from the US, from other places who found themselves located in Britain, certainly from, um, you know, the 17th, 18th century onwards, and organized themselves in Britain in various ways, which were influential, um, not just in Britain, but had an influence on what was going on in Africa, what was going on in the Caribbean, what was going on in the US and so on. So it was a hub. It was a hub of activity uh, and a hub of various Pan-African networks which spread across the world. So I think that's another reason why it's significant. And as I said, um, or alluded to earlier, the Pan-African movement, the modern Pan-African movement was birthed in Britain, uh, led by Alice Kinloch in the 1890s, uh, modern Pan-African movement began in Britain. And so that's also very important and has given it certain characteristics that perhaps people forget about today. So I think for those reasons, there may be other reasons as well, Britain has a, um, a significant 
influence and role in the world as far as you know people of African descent, African heritage are concerned. Of course, one can also look at Britain, as I said, as a big imperialist power, and Britain's influence and uh, interference in the world over the last 500 years, which also has significance and which kind of links people all over the world together, you know, because so many places in Africa were British colonies, so many places in the Caribbean were British colonies, the US itself was a British colony. I mean, it had that, its tentacles spread everywhere. And so the resistance to those tentacles, the cutting off of those tentacles, um, the whole, as I say, the whole role that Britain played and, do, and still plays. Mm -hmm. That was a question world. I was going to also ask you. Gives, that was a question yeah, I was going to ask you. Yeah. you know, about... yeah, I mean, you just, you... yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was, I was saying that was, excuse me for interrupting you, that was a question I was going to ask you, and you, you were going that direction in terms of that it still plays in terms of how, because generally when you're hearing the news here, you hear about France, you hear about the United States, maybe the the impact, the connection between British history, UK history, and events in Africa right now. I mean, we heard some about Zimbabwe, obviously about Southern Africa, but continent-wide, uh, the English colonies, shall they say, are all around the African continent. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the, it doesn't matter what you look at. If you look at the political systems which exist in many African countries, they are essentially, you know, the British system in one form or another. Um, you know, the, the system of representative democracy that was developed in Britain is the system which exists in the U.S., exists in Africa, exists everywhere, more or less. So that is one one aspect of it. If you look at, you know, the law in many countries, in, in many countries in Africa, it's still based on, you know, English law, British law, and even the, the garments that lawyers wear and so on. So there, there's so many mm -hmm. issues. The fact that people speak English all over the world is another issue, of course. Um, so there's so many, apart from the leaving aside the interference of the British state, British imperialism, one only has to think about Libya, um, just what are we, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, um, the interference in the Maghreb today, um, interference, you know, all around the world, yes, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, if you look at the big multinational companies that have their tentacles in Africa, many of them are kind of British based to have British connections. Um, so it, its interference is, you know, then it has its agencies, the Westminster Foundation, uh, you know, there are so many, so many ways in which Britain continues, it has its armed forces in many African countries. There, you know, one could go on forever talking mm -hmm. about the role that Britain plays. And yeah, these days it may seem like it's a junior partner to the US, um, but it's still plays a significant role and the, the the great and the good in Britain, the white men of property would be boasting that they punch above their weight. You know, it's a tiny, tiny little country, but it still interferes in everybody's business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Hakeem Adi we're speaking with here on, uh, on Africa today. The current battle, uh, and we don't use the word generally here, I don't think, uh, re redundant, maybe you're laid off, maybe you're fired, whatever it, it is. This current yeah. battle which you're involved in, you and those who are part of your global community, um, where the program has been closed down, essentially you've been made redundant, I meaning you've been laid off, you've been you've been fired at, at Chichester. Just give us just a short sketch of that, and we can keep going into that. But what's the implications of this? for not only the work that you and the other people, the young historians and others, but for, for black people, for young black people in England, for in Britain? Well, I, very, very briefly, just to explain that, I taught a course, a master's level course, um, in the history of Africa and the African diaspora, which was the only one of its kind in this country or in, or in Europe. Uh, and in fact, 
maybe even more widely. There were not there were not many of them. It was specifically set up from 2018 onwards, especially to encourage students of African descent or African and Caribbean heritage, if you like, to study history, because we have a problem in Britain that people are very often alienated from studying history because of the Eurocentric way in which it's very often presented. So in response, really, to the recommendations of the community, we well, I set up this course in 2018. Um, we recruited not only from Britain, but we had students from the Caribbean, from Africa, from the US, uh, even from, from Asia. We recruited every year and we, five years, we produced seven PhD students, six in Britain, one in the US. So we thought it, it did what it was set up to do. It attracted mainly overwhelmingly black students. It encouraged them to engage and undertake their own research. It led many of them to, to undertake PhDs and so on. So that was all fine um, until May this year when the university said that it was going to set targets for all its master's level courses. Um, but it set targets um, kind of after the fact. In other words, it said, OK, we'll look at recruitment in May. And if you don't, if you haven't got you know, five students registered, then we will suspend the course. Um, that is what happened. Um, the course was suspended, or recruitment to the course was suspended. Those students who had enrolled for September this year were told that the course was closed. And then two months later, the university linked my post uh, as a professor to that course. They said, okay, that, that course does not recruit enough students for our liking. Therefore, we're going to sack you. So that, that's essentially what, what has happened. What is the, what is the, you, you, we, we talked before, I've heard you speak before, and you, you talked about the conference that was had, the founding of the Young Scholars, the activism of the community, uh, much of this around this period in history where Black voices have been prominent around the world. What 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 does this mean? What's the implications of this? How do you talk about a country of over two million African people, and you don't have a course on Africa and African the African diaspora at the, the and and access to it through the masters and research? Explain this to yeah, us, Doctor. Well, it's 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 a problem that we have in this country that. There are not many, there is, there is a problem at all levels of education that the history of Africa and Africans is, is largely ignored. I would say people of African and Caribbean heritage in this country is largely ignored. And if we go back to 2020 and BLM, of course there were protests ac across this country and people as well as acknowledging the crimes that were carried out in the US. Uh, people here also wanted to acknowledge the crimes that were carried out here in terms of state violence, police violence, police racism, state racism. And one of the things that many young people highlighted was the issue of history, that they were not taught anything relating to themselves, that they went to school and they never had a had were presented with any history which related to them, their families, their ancestors, Africa, the Caribbean, or anything of this kind. This is, you could say, a, a kind of legacy of, you know, human trafficking, colonialism in this country, that it, it tends to have a um, Eurocentrism of the past is very much alive, but of course, um, as in all things, there is struggle, and we are, we've tried to change that for many years, but it's still problematic. Mm -hmm. It's problematic in schools and elsewhere. And many young people will tell you that the only thing they ever hear about Africa and Africans is slavery. That's the only thing they know, and they're fed up with hearing that and so on. So as a result, as I mentioned earlier, young black people 
get a turned off history. They say, well, it's not about us. It's negative. It's derogatory. We don't want to hear about it and so on. So in 2015, we held a conference called History Matters to, to look into really what was going on, why there were so few young people coming through the system, very few black academic historians, very few school teachers, very few postgraduate students and so on. And we called on young people themselves to speak and to, to examine what was going on and the conference was very successful and it gave rise to a number of initiatives, a number of recommendations. One of them was to establish the Young Historians Project as a, a means to encourage young people to develop their own his, history projects, to carry out their own research and then present the results of that research in interesting ways, in stimulating ways to their peers, whether that's through, you know, games or ex online exhibitions or uh, documentary film or murals or whatever it might be. And that project has been running for eight years for young people between the ages of 16 and 25. Another recommendation was precisely to set up the MRES to deal with this problem. Um, so we set it up and we ran it in the way that I've indicated. So the fact that it's been effectively closed down uh, has impacted not only on the students who were, were and are undertaking that course, there are about half a dozen of those students at the moment, but also on my PhD students. I have 10 PhD students, uh, again, all students of African and Caribbean heritage who are without a supervisor. So in total, 16 postgraduate students, probably the largest cohort of, of black postgraduate history students in Britain, have their, all of their research has been disrupted. They have no one to supervise them. You know, it's a terrible situation. In addition, the fact that a course, which was the only one of its kind, has been closed down means that nobody in Britain now has access to a degree course on the history of Africa and the African diaspora. There's nothing at undergraduate level. There's nothing at postgraduate level. And as you say, there's now no access, no means of easily of students uh, if you like, engaging with history and maybe going on to do more research or do PhDs. That is what we, we provided. So overall, we could say the impact is a massive attack on the study and teaching of our history because it's been removed. Whatever the university might say it's doing or whatever intention or even if it had a good intention, the impact is on those 16 students and everybody else. And it's as if the university is saying, well, this history doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. You know, if, we, if we prevent um, students in the future having this access and, and engaging and studying and researching, it doesn't really matter. If 16 students lose their supervisor and their studies are disrupted, it doesn't really matter. If we sack, you know, perhaps, as you mentioned, the first person of African heritage to become a history professor, somebody who's, I say so myself, quite eminent, writes a lot, speaks a lot, produces books. If we get rid of him, it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to care. This is a kind of attitude. This is what it says to people, um, that they just don't care. Who, who, should, who should care? And in fact, a lot of people do care. And the response to the actions of the university has been Thousands of people signing a petition, all kinds of you know, people writing letters, people on social media, even people on the US signing petitions, writing letters, complaining, unfortunately to no avail at the moment. But that campaign, which the students themselves initiated, will continue with various legal challenges and um, it is important that we stand up and say our history matters. Our history is important. Our students are important. The research we do is important. The, if you like, our historians are important and need to be treated with respect and with dignity and so on. I think this is what people all over the world, literally all over the world, have said in this particular case.
Mm-hmm. You give us an example. I'm, I'm actually reading as we're talking uh, this uh, letter to the uh, vice chancellor at the University of uh, Chichester, and the question is, uh, how can a course which has, quoting, undeniably contributed so much to a deeper and deeper nuanced understanding of both British and world history, <coughs> world history, be shut down overnight with no consultation with either students or Professor Adi himself. Uh, I, I can give us an example of a, how should I say it, of a, of a two or three week lesson that's part of or, or, or a month uh, syllabus uh, that's part of the courses that you've been teaching that you've been taking the master's and research students through. Uh, give well, us a, we have, a quick example. We, Okay, well, I can tell you, we have essentially two modules, as we call them, two 10-week courses. One is on, I would say, kind of research skills and thinking about history. What kind of history do we write? Who is it centered on? How do we make sure it includes everybody, that it includes women, for example, that it includes voices that we may not always hear? What are the sources of history? Where do we get the raw material of history from, whether that might be archive or oral history or other sources of history? So one of the courses looks to those kinds of questions, but also prepares students to do things like a literature review, uh, how to write a research proposal, these kind of technical things which are necessary in the academic world. So it's about these kinds of skills. The other course is a, an overview of history relating to Africa and the African diaspora. Now, very often in the U.S. it's a little bit different, but certainly in this country, the, the history of Africa is normally separated from the history of the diaspora. Um, we don't take that approach in the course. We look at the way in which this history was interconnected, intertwined, interwoven, and so on. And so we start, we can't include everything, of course, in roughly 10 weeks, but we look at various examples of that. So one of the places we'd like to start is with the Haitian Revolution, which I've mentioned earlier, because the Haitian Revolution, although it took place in the Caribbean, was weighed by the vast majority of people who engaged in that struggle were born in Africa. They brought with them military skills from Africa. They brought with them political skills from Africa. They brought with them philosophical worldviews from Africa. They even brought with them African languages and used them. Um, so we, we look at that as an example, a very good example of how these two histories of Africa and the diaspora are interconnected. And of course, it's one of the most important episodes in the modern history, not just of Africa and the diaspora, but the modern history of the world. And so we center our students in that place and we look at that. Then we look at, uh, again, a whole series of activities actually centered on Britain in this case. We look at Britain in the 18th century and the role of what I call, or what we call the thinking African. Um, And thinking African means people like Alaudo Equiano would be an example, Otto Guana, there are others. But if we just take Alaudo Equiano, people may have heard of him, a former enslaved African who then became a, an abolitionist, a best-selling writer, a political activist. And so we look at, in particular, his writing, his work, and try and look at it significance in this period what role did africans play so when we say the thinking african what that means is that africans in that period in britain demonstrated their humanity um, because the the prevailing uh, we could say ideology of the, the white men of property was that africans were not human Um, and therefore they could be enslaved and treated like animals and so on. And so these very important individuals like Equiano countered that. They countered that undermining of their humanity in writing. They wrote about what it was like to be an African. They wrote about what Africa was like. They showed Africa as being, you know, highly civilized and so on. They wrote in the language of the 18th century, even of 18th century Christianity and so on. So we look at all of that Mm -hmm. 
and discuss those kind of issues. Then we look at, um, again, in the case of Ecuador, we have an, an African, somebody born in Africa who happened to end up in London. So he doesn't stop being an African, and he even referred mm -hmm. to himself as the African or an African. And he was involved in an organization called the Sons of Africa. They, you know, this is one of the first usages of the, the idea, the concept of being an African. And so those, these are very important things. Then we look at things like, uh, what else do we look at? We look at the issue of, for example, in the 19th century, again, building on what I've just said, the question of what people at that time called vindication vindicating being an African. What did that mean? Again, fighting against the Eurocentrism of the day, looking back into Africa's history, uh, talking about the glories of ancient Egypt, of Kush, of wherever it might happen to be. And that is one thing which characterized the 19th century very generally. You had people writing, um, whether it was you know David Walker writing about these things, or whether it was uh, Martin Delaney or whoever it might be, there, uh, there are many other examples. James, James Africanus Halton in Britain, and there were many who wrote in this way, defending the humanity of Africans, uh, undermining the racist arguments of the day, uh, defending Africa's history as significantly important. So we look at that, but we also look at the issue of repatriation of people from the diaspora returning to Africa in various ways during that period. Sometimes it might be people who return from Brazil, people who return from Cuba, people who return from Canada, from Nova Scotia, or from Britain, or whatever. What was that about? Why did Africans in the diaspora think they needed to return mm -hmm. to the African continent and so on? So we look at vindication and repatriation uh, in the 19th century, and then we go on. I mean, that's just giving you three weeks, three okay. weeks. So we look at various moments in modern history where the history of Africa and the diaspora intersect uh, and discuss those and analyze those. And the reason for doing that is partly for students to understand that history and have a, because many may have come without having that broad knowledge of modern history, but it's also to stimulate the students to think about their own research, because at the end of 10 weeks, they will have to develop a research project. And so we're trying to stimulate them to think about various moments in history. Are they mainly interested in the 20th century, or the 18th century, or the 19th century, or some other period? Um, and to get them to think about the sources of the history, where are they going to look for okay. what we in historians call primary sources, original mm -hmm. sources. Mm -hmm. So that's what the course aims to do, to prepare mm -hmm. students to carry out their own research, because their own research project, they have to write a 24,000 word dissertation. That is the main way in which this particular master's program is assessed mm -hmm. and, and examined. Mm -hmm. it, it must have been, I'm, I'm here kind of thinking and smiling and frowning at the same time. And I, I, I know when you've spoken before, when you began your university course, your, your, your studies, Dr. Adi, it must have been a battle for you to get through and your community to get through along with you to this, to this point. Uh, if there's just one course and in some sense it has been carried by, uh, Dr. Hakeem Adi, LLC, Limited, uh, it must have really been a battle, my brother. Well, with us, without struggle, there's no progress. You, you have to do, like I said, we held a conference, we identified a problem, and the conference identified solutions or possible solutions to that problem. I implemented some of them. And we, we carry out the work. And, uh, but there's a hard we, part to it, Hakeem. Is that there's a hard Dr. Adi dragging a tractor part to it, is there not? Yeah, but you have to, if you recognize the problem, you have to try and solve it. And okay. then people will come with you. People will come with you and join you and 
you know, I have 16 students who are with me. And if anybody says to them, you know, where, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? They say, well, I want to be with Hakeem. So that's, uh, not, that's not because I have some magic wand. It's because they recognize the usefulness of the work that we're jointly doing. Um, you know, you have to you have to fight for things. If you think they're important, you have to fight for them. You, you my experience is you you take up the, you take a stand, and when you take a stand, people will support you and can come to you and so on. If you don't do anything, nothing will change. There's no point complaining, <laughs> saying, isn't, it, "Isn't the world terrible?" Yes, it is terrible. So then let's do something about it. We're, we're, we're here, you know, that's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. We're here to make the world a better place than it was when we got here and to be of service to, to others. I mean, what, what other reason is there? So that's what I try and do. I'm not always successful. Sometimes you get knocked back. It's not the first time. It's not the first time I've been sacked. It's, that's what I was. That's what I was asking you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, you, as I said, I was sacked in whenever it was, 2010 or some of it. I've come back. I came back stronger. I achieved more. So, uh, you know, pe the people have to stand with me. And that's what the students have done. That's what the 12,000 people who have signed the petition have done and others. Um, and we will keep going. We keep, we'll keep fighting and do what we can to try and solve the problem. What else can we do? What did they do in Haiti? They didn't. Do, they, didn't they weren't struggling for, for, for six months. Mm -hmm. They're struggling for 13 years. People losing their lives. Did they sit down and say, oh, it's a bit tough. It's a bit tough. You know, we've only defeated the, the British. Now we've got the Spanish to deal with. What should we do, give up? No, they defeated the Spanish as well. What are they going to do then, give up? No, then they defeated the French. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they kept fighting until they liberated the country. So, the, 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 you know, one of the reasons for, you see, said, why did I choose Frederick Douglass? You know, if you read Frederick Douglass, you know, and particularly his first narrative, you know, from the first pages almost, you can see this is a person who's not going to be messed around. He's going to fight for what he thinks is right. And he says, doesn't he? He says, the man who would whip me must first kill me. That's his, that's his approach to things. The man who would whip me must first kill me. And that's what he did. Someone tried to whip him, and he, <laughs> he put him on his back. Mm -hmm. You know, you also so, made the point about you you pushed back. Maybe that's the wrong word. I'll let you choose that word on the on the wind rush theme. I've heard you speak on that for a moment, and, and share that with us, and then we'll talk about the way that people support the work of those who are, are standing to support the work that all of you have done. Well, the thing about, um, you know, the, the history that I work on in Britain is it's very, very long history. You know, the, the, in fact, the book, as I said, it goes back to 2,000 years and even beyond. And almost as long as I've been writing and teaching and speaking and studying history, people have tried to say this history begins in 1948 with the arrival of some ship. And it's just not true. So, <laughs> so I'm just telling, I'm just saying that's not true. And if you say that history begins in 1948, then you don't talk about the Manchester Pan-African Congress. You don't talk about Equiano. You don't talk about, you know, the Africans who were here in the Roman period. You leave it all out. You say, well, it's not really significant. It, it's a distortion of history. And the, the problem, the other problem is, particularly in the present time, we have a, a very interesting you know, population here, which is made up largely, 
largely, not entirely, largely of two different types of people. And this is why I always refer to these two different types of people. Some who come directly or their immediate family, their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents, come from the African continent. We have another group of people who come from the Caribbean. Now, you know, in many circumstances, you might want to unite those two communities and so on and so forth. If you focus, if your presentation of history focuses on a ship that came in 1948, you are looking at the current population of this country really and only focusing on one of those groups. That is those whose immediate families and, and forebears came from the Caribbean. Now, actually, in numerical terms, that group is the smaller group because the group that came from the African continent so on is the larger group. So you're actually excluding the history of the majority of people. So that can't be right. And you're presenting a vision of Britain, which kind of prioritizes one section and excludes everybody else. So I, to me, that's not correct. That's misleading. Um, it's not only is it misleading, it's kind of writing people out of history. And I'm all about writing people into history, not excluding people. And so for that reason, I'm not particularly interested in a ship. The other thing about just from the point of view of, of factual information, if you wanted to begin your history in the post-1945 period with ships, then you have to look at all the ships that came in that period, the ships that came in 1947. Um, you, you know, you just have to be accurate about it. So it's really just a question of, of accuracy, of not misleading people, of not excluding people, of celebrating all of the history. Because as a historian, one of the things that we fight against is is exclusion, is people trying to truncate the history, people trying to hide aspects of the history. Um, people are trying to say, well, it's not very important, it's not very long, you know, new people have only just arrived here and so on. And we say, no, that's not, that's not the case. And so that's, that's really my position on all of that. Yeah, I, I like the way that you speak about that when you're doing uh, uh, interviews. You're very historically uh, pointed about it. And at the same time, if I can use the word here, you're somewhat dismissive of this notion that somehow it should start with a ship that arrived in, in 1948, and, and thank you for, for that. How, how many languages? You have, have you, some of your books been translated into other languages, Dr. Adi? That is true. Uh, Pan-Africanism has been translated into uh, Portuguese. It's a Portuguese edition. It's being translated into Spanish uh, in Cuba. It will be, it's also been translated into French. Uh, it's at the moment being translated into Arabic. Pan-Africanism and communism has been translated into Spanish. We're hoping to translate it into Portuguese soon. Um, yeah, that's where we are at the moment, I think. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully we we will we will have yeah we can we'll make them available to in any languages where people people want want to want to read. And and, and how do people? I'm, I'm again I'm smiling here because I'm thinking that any institution with even a, a smidgen of commitment to the theme of education and their students in the community would be thirsting to have a Dr. Hakim Adi and the community that he and others have built around looking at history, African history, diaspora history, Pan-Africanism. How, how do people, uh, and that's from, re from reading all of your works, uh, Dr. Adi, how do people get in touch with, with the work that you're doing? They can go to your website. I know that there are a number of places where there are petitions around uh, around this work, around making sure that the students are taken care of, that you're respected. 
uh, that the program continues, the young historians. Uh, I've, heard, I've seen letter. I was reading a letter in the editorial in the Nigerian, Nigerian newspaper on this particular mm-hmm. topic. How do, how do people stay in touch, Dr. Adi? Well, I'm very easy to get in touch with. You mentioned the website, hakimari.org. People can get in touch with the, the campaign around the, the closure of the course and my sacking by going to historymatters.online. Um, so that's there. They can, I'm on social media. People can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I'm very easy to find, <laughs> very easy to get hold of. So if anybody wants me, uh, all these universities in the U.S. who are obviously enlightened and think about scholarship in the way you've just described, I'm sure that they would be beating a path to my door. Although I've just looked outside and I can't see any of them lined up. But you never know. <laughs> after your after this program, they may they may all be flying here or they may be contacting me. I don't know. We'll, they we'll should... see how effective your program is. They 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 certainly. <laughs> no pressure. They certainly should be. Are you, uh, and and what are you, are you working? I I, I I feel bad about asking you this because your your volume of work is is so big. Uh, are there other projects that you have in the works, Doctor Adi? Yes, um, I'm kind of about to start work on the next book, which will look at the kind of period of decolonization, so-called decolonization. And the period of, also that coincides with the period of the Cold War. And so we'll look at some of those issues. Um, yeah, in, in a way, it's a kind of, I hope it will be a sort of companion piece to Pan Africanism and communism. We'll look at kind of Pan Africanism and the anti colonial movements in the, in the period of the, the Cold War. And. Uh, Look at the, the struggles of people to um, to liberate themselves and the, the, their countries of origin, uh, in Africa in particular, and the the difficulties, the impediments, I suppose, that the Cold War period really put in place to to prevent that. And some of the organisations that people formed to overcome these difficulties, some of them based in Britain, but linking up with people in in Europe in the US and in other places. So that's the aim. It's in its very early stages and it's actually been disrupted by mm-hmm. all of this uh, sacking and problems confronting my students, which has been going on for the last, you know, the whole summer period, really. That was a period when I was, I was going to really begin work on it. So we need to get things resolved. I want to get things resolved for my students' sake, but also for my own sake, so I can just concentrate on my my work, on my writing, on research, and, and so on. Mm-hmm. Dr. Hakim Adi is a British historian, scholar who specializes in African affairs. Uh, you can Google him, Hakim Adi, last name spelled Adi. Uh, more than 11 uh, texts. Uh, one of the more recent ones is African and Caribbean People in Britain, uh, which is on uh, Allen Lane, I believe, which is going to be coming out in paperback. I would also encourage you to take a look at Pan-Africanism uh, History, which reads like a, uh, a novel. It's one of those page turners. And also take a look at the, the, the brilliant work in Pan-Africanism and, uh, and communism. Uh, Google Dr. Adi and see how you can support this effort, not only for Dr. Adi and his community, uh, but for all of those who want to make sure that people are not othered uh, and excluded. Uh, in this historical narrative. Habib, we look forward to seeing you on the West Coast again, and you take the best of care, my brother. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you anytime. I'm always, always happy to come and see you.